If I might take a moment of personal privilege, I would just like to say how wonderful it is to see your faces today. It is a joy and a privilege to be back, and I appreciate uh, your having us here once again in your midst. Uh, we thank you for your prayers for us, and we also pray for you, and uh, it is just so good to see you. Let us pray now for illumination. By your light, O oh God, may these my simple human words become light for us this day. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verses 2, 6, and 7. Let us listen for God's word to us this day. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Having heard beautiful poetry from the prophet Isaiah, we turn now to the gospel according to John and to another breathtaking poem. Listen once more for God's word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child. As the organ whispered the first notes of this carol, 
the ushers slipped down the side aisles in the dark. At first, the pinpoints of light they carried from the Christ candle were barely visible, but soon the light spread, candle to candle, until the glow billowed toward us like an ocean wave bound for the shore. By the second verse, our children were no longer singing, just clutching their plastic candle holders, watching and waiting for the light. Our center aisle, last pew, get out of dodge if the kids act up seats meant that we were the last to have our candles lit, but the first to recess from the warmth of the chapel into the crisp New Jersey night. I lifted my then three-year-old son into my arms and walked down the steps onto the quadrangle of Princeton Theological Seminary. Maybe it was the Advent season. Maybe it was the clear, starry sky. Maybe it was the candlelight. But whatever it was, I found myself caught up in the moment. I glanced over at my husband, who had left a job he loved so that we could move to New Jersey so that I could enter seminary. I thought of you all, of family, mentors, and friends that we left behind when we rolled out of Chapin in moving trucks. I glimpsed the faces of our children aglow in the candlelight. They were singing again, and my eyes welled up with tears. Just as I began to feel the swell of gratitude that often manifests itself as a lump in the throat, I suddenly felt warm. I wish I could tell you that I felt the warmth of a spiritual experience, or even the warmth of my family huddled together singing Christmas carols. But no, my hair was on fire. (laughs) My son's candle and my hairspray, as it turns out, were not good neighbors. A quick-thinking chorister behind me smothered the fire with his music folder. All was well after I received a rather drastic haircut and made a small donation to the seminary music department. But my vivid recollection of the experience lingers. Trust me, lighting one's hair on fire is a memory that sticks. As preachers are wont to do, I decided the mishap of singed curls might have theological significance. So nowadays, when I reflect on this startling event, I am reminded of a biblical truth. The light of the world rarely comes to us in the way that we want, or even in the way we have come to expect. We cannot control Jesus' being born into our lives any more than we can control a lit candle in the the hand of a three-year-old. But oh, how we try. We try to turn the wild flame of the light of the world into something safe, and manageable, something a bit more like the LED lights on the Christmas tree than an open flame. Each Advent season, as we prepare to welcome Christ into the manger, we expect him to bring with him goodness and wholeness, warmth and comfort. We tend to forget altogether the vulnerability in the story of Jesus' birth, the fleeing from Herod, the exposure to the elements, the uncertainty of childbirth, the complete dependence of a newborn baby. Instead, and rightfully so, we tend to focus on the promise of a mighty Savior. Isaiah prophesies that the Messiah will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this, now this is a Messiah we want a Messiah we can get behind. We want a Messiah who makes everything right with little potential to interrupt our daily lives. With the shepherds and angels, we want to gaze at a picture-perfect, not at all inconvenient baby asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus 
no crying he makes. Really? No crying? Are you kidding me? We want a Messiah who doesn't make too much of a ruckus. But have you ever known of a baby who didn't cry? Now I know what you're thinking. Austin, Jesus was not like other babies. Jesus was special. And I hear you on that. But think about it. Don't you seriously doubt that even a fully divine baby is perfectly content to lie in a feed trough in the cold? Not if he's also fully human, I propose. Thing is, if Jesus did not know hunger or cold, how could he ever know the deepest hunger of our souls or the coldness of pain and grief around the holidays? If Jesus did not cry in order to communicate his needs, then how could Jesus hear the cries of God's people? In light of these questions, it seems to me that we do well to consider that the Messiah who was and is born unto us is both more understanding and more demanding of us than we might have imagined. If you're anything like me, you long for the Christ child to enter the home of your heart, but you would prefer that he stay out of the back rooms. Well, you know which ones I'm talking about, right? They're those rooms where we shove all the junk of our lives out of sight and then close the door. Perhaps we're hoping that the darkness will mask the brokenness, swallow the guilt, silence the shame, and sequester the sinfulness we would rather not see. Perhaps we do not fully trust that the light of Christ will be a worthy opponent for the mess we've made. We're worried about the parts of us that the light of Christ might expose. Perhaps even more than that, we're worried about the ways that Christ's light piercing our darkness might transform us. We're worried that we might be changed. Christmas Day has come and gone this year. The Advent wreath and the ornaments will soon be packed away with the nativity set and stockings. We have sung Silent Night, candles in hand. We have exchanged Christmas greetings and gifts. We lit the Christ candle on Christmas Eve and proclaimed joy to the world. We welcomed a crying God with us baby. But Christmas isn't over. Sure, the season lasts 12 days in the church calendar, but it's way more than that. We have welcomed the light, but now, now we must be the light. Our God calls us to reflect the light of Christ to a hurting world. We must carry our candles into the darkness, dare to go even where we may not be safe for the sake of a Savior who has never been placid or tame. We go into our own communities, even though we might find rejection there. But I hope we go knowing this truth, that the light of the world goes with us. Friends, the promise of the gospel is this. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.